Hello, everyone. In this uh, lecture podcast, I will provide an overview of corporate governance. And my name is Manjo Oyson, your unit coordinator for Laws 20063 on governance and business law. A lot of you, because you're probably probably be working with companies, and I wonder if some of you may actually be working uh, with you know, some public firms, but you've probably come across the idea of corporate governance, mainly because it has been part of the public discourse for some time, especially in recent years. And the thing about corporate governance is that as a concept, it has often been associated with corporate collapses and corporate failures. So that when a firm shuts down and leaves shareholders losing perhaps their life savings, uh, losing a lot of their money because you know the money they put in in investing in a company and buying shares uh, burned to burn to the ground upon the upon a corporate failure. Or it could be that because when a company failed, you know you, there would be hundreds, if not thousands, of workers who lost their jobs. And in the case of the United States, for example, uh, there were instances when the U.S. government had to intervene in order to bail out a lot of these huge conglomerates, which were too huge to fail. And so therefore, in recent years, the discourse on corporate governance has often been associated with corporate failure. So that the question has often been that, you know, how could these things have happened? Wouldn't there have been, you know, better corporate governance mechanisms that could have been prevented, that could have prevented uh, these massive corporate failures and corporate collapses that, that brought along a huge toll and cost to society and to a lot of to a lot of other individuals. So, when we speak of corporate governance, for example, we probably recall for those of us who were, you know, uh, a bit uh, already in our adult years in the 1980s. Uh, I was probably in my high school in the 1980s. Yeah, and uh, some of you may have come across. Uh, the insider trading scandals involving Drexel, Burnham, and Lambert. And a lot of the uh, well-known names at this time, or should I say notorious names at that time, would involve Michael Milken and Ivan Boweski. And uh, I actually ended up reading a fascinating nonfiction book about what they did during this time, which actually involved insider trading. So the 1980s, uh, in the 1980s, there were a lot of instances when insider trading was quite common, so that um, somebody who was working in a particular firm was aware about, of what would go on, what was going on in that particular enterprise and whether or not it was a publicly listed company or even if it was not publicly listed, but because it was aware of you know, the, the plans and activities of that particular firm, they would then deal with some of their people outside and on the basis of that advanced knowledge and insider information they had. We're in a position to actually, you know, make money by selling um, the shares of that company, not necessarily public listed, but you know, the shares of that company, either because the the company was about to lose money or it, it was about to make money. And people like Michael Milken and Ivan Bowiski mailed hundreds of millions of dollars uh, because of insider trading. But as a result, that eventually led to the collapse of Drexel Burnham Lambert, one of the bigger investment companies in the 1980s. So that was mainly, uh, you know, when you talk about corporate governance in the 1980s, it was as a result of insider trading. And the question was, where was corporate governance then? And in the 1990s, uh, you would have come across, you know, uh, well-known companies like Enron, Worldcom, uh, Barings Bank, and Arthur Anderson. And in these instances, what had happened was that there were accounting tricks that were involved, and uh, there were, in the case of Barrings Bank, it involved uh, rogue traders. So looking at Enron, for example, um, this was a huge conglomerate that was actually into energy and you know, mining, and it was a very profitable, profitable operation. However, uh, it had gone into a lot of uh, risky investments, and in the process, after a while, it had ended up losing a lot of money. And it was able to, the company was able to hide a lot of these uh, losing investments by playing around with their accounting books. And they hired at that time a 
very well-known uh, global accounting and auditing firm, which was Arthur Anderson. But again, because Arthur Anderson was making a lot of money by auditing the books of Enron, they weren't really acting uh, independently, as independent as they, as they should have. And in the process, they, they just signed off on the financial statements of Enron, even if these financial statements turn out eventually to be, uh, to be dubious. And when Enron therefore collapsed, and shareholders lost their money, banks lost their money, creditors lost their money. Not only did um, you know the, the investors and shareholders try to run after uh, the, the, the the executive team that were running and uh, uh, running and run, but at the same time they also ran after Ar Arthur Anderson for, in a sense, being part of the collusion uh, in the process of cooking and hiding, you know, the, the accounting tricks of Enron. And again, the question of, uh, about corporate governance emerged at that time, mainly because the question was, you know, how could this have happened? Were there corporate governance systems in place that would have prevented these accounting tricks? In the case of rogue uh, traders like Barings Bank, you know, could these have prevented the, the collapse or huge losses in these companies? Uh, in the 2000s, which was, you know, uh, in this millennium, uh, and we, recall, we will most likely recall the global financial crisis where a lot of uh, huge companies in the United States, for example, uh, ended up having to be bailed out by the U.S. government because they were about to, uh, to shut down their doors. And this included the huge insurance and investment companies such as AIG. Uh, it included Ford Motors, uh, which again had to be bailed out by uh, the U.S. government. And in these instances, a lot of these companies had actually engaged in what were known as very risky investments. But when you think about it, that is what companies are meant to do. They're meant to, make, to undertake risk because the more risky an investment is, the higher the returns are meant to be. And that's what we learned in management and you know, accounting. But sometimes a lot of these investments were ultra risky. And we then realized that uh, we get a sense that the people running the company, either as directors or as managers, we realize that oftentimes when a company shuts its doors or collapses, there is a problem because the, the ones who are running the company don't really own the company. And so we, we talk about the agency problem in a short while, but again, there were questions about corporate governance or failures of corporate governance uh, in the new millennium, primarily because of risky investments. Now. However, when we talk about corporate governance, it's actually much older, as we see later on, uh, Bob Schricker talking about it, because um, corporate governance, as we later on see, talks about the authority that is within a company and talks about authority of companies have always been there. And as a result, you know, even in the 1500s, even in the 1600s, when there were royal charters given by various sovereign governments for the East India Company or the Dutch uh, Indian Company, well, when they were trying to trade in the 1600s in Asia or Southeast Asia, there was a government, uh, a sovereign charter. And again, we talk about authority in these instances. So in that sense, you know, uh, corporate governance is not, is not really something new. And corporate governance was also highlighted in the 1930s, primarily because of the very uh, influential book by Merlin Means. When they empirically validated that there had been changes in the corporate enterprise at that time, because whereas prior to the 1930s and especially in the 1800s, what we then saw was that those who ended up managing the company were also the owners of the company. So therefore, as owners of the company, they wanted to make sure that the way they managed the, the company would ensure not only profitability, but the sustainability of the business. But the empirical uh, study of Berlin Means uncovered the fact that there had been a huge change in the corporate enterprises then so because there was now a separation of ownership and the management of the company. Those who managed the company were not, in fact, the, the owners of the company. They were now, in many of these publicly listed companies, there were now huge enterprises when, I mean, there were huge enterprises and instances when uh, these huge conglomerates were managed by people who had very little ownership or in fact no ownership in the firm. And that brought along questions about issues of agency. So that the, the, the managers were in fact agents of the principals who were the 
owners of the company or the directors were agents of the, comp of the owners of the company. And when you think about the principal agent problem, when I, for example, appoint you as an agent, the question that arises in my mind is, if I appoint you as an agent and I give you a certain authority, could I trust you to make decisions or undertake acts that would actually protect my interest? And that, is, that doesn't always happen. And, that talks, and that's about um, the agency problem in corporate governance. At the same time, in 1971, uh, Mace, again, uh, in her book, realized that you know, she was trying to figure out what we would think directors should be doing. Is that actually what is happening empirically? And she found out that what we had expected directors to do uh, were the things that directors were actually doing. So the, the, the discourse about corporate governance has actually been there for quite some time, although it has gained prominence in the 1980s and especially uh, in the second millennium. So, and corporate governance, the problem about corporate governance isn't just about uh, what has happened abroad, but it has actually happened closer to home with corporate collapses in Australia itself. And one of the well-known ones would be the HIH insurance, which was one of the largest corporate collapses uh, in, in Australia. And notably, when the Royal Commission investigating the collapse of the HIH insurance, because it uh, led to massive losses, not only to the to the shareholders, but to the creditors and to the suppliers and even customers. What, had, what the Royal Commission had uncovered was that there was no finding of fraud or embezzlement. And yet questions about corporate governance failures had been raised. So in other words, when you talk about corporate governance, it is simply, it is not always because there is fraud or wrongdoing or attempts to steal money from, from a company. It could be because uh, in the case of HIH, uh, the, the top executives and even the directors were involved in opulence and corporate extravagance, you know, paying for the foreign trips of um, even advisors or even their secretaries. And, you know, the, the, any of these major expenditures were just rubber stamped by the directors. And there were also overpriced acquisitions of firms, overpriced acquisitions of particular investments and so on. Which meant, therefore, that after a while, because uh, these acquisitions were, in fact, overvalued, it meant that these translated into huge losses for, for the companies such as HIH insurance. And notably, what, should, what you should realize, when you say that there was you know, corporate extravagance, um, you know, um, directors and top executives paying themselves so much money, it's not really something new, right? You even hear about this even today in Australia. And, um, if, and one of them, I'm not going to mention his name, but you would be aware of him, uh, you know, somebody who was very much involved in um, Commonwealth and state elections. And when his business shut down, a lot of uh, people lost their jobs in Queensland. And again, there are questions about corporate extravagance and the possibility that there was embezzlement and that the fact that, you know, the, this corporate owner, because he was a, the majority shareholder of the company, was actually using corporate funds for the poor purpose of you know paying off his own debts or paying off somebody that was related to him, so it's not something new. As well, uh, you will recall perhaps the case of OneTel, which uh, was one of the largest tel telecom companies in Australia, the fourth largest one. But because of weaknesses in internal control, problems about financial reporting, the quality of the audit, the board scrutiny of management, and the poor executive to pay. Uh, pay to performance relationship. In other words, even when the business was performing badly, the executives continued to be paid huge salaries and huge bonuses. Eventually, OneTel again collapsed, and which brought in its way huge losses, not only for the shareholders, but for creditors and suppliers, as well as customers, and also society, because society then will have to intervene in the sense that those people who would have lost their jobs and lost their incomes needed to be supported by the Australian government. Uh, either in the form of, you know, um, severe pay, or it could be in the form of pensions and so on. So, at this point, therefore, we have highlighted, you know, the, the problems that have brought about the need to engage in a deeper and a more, more thoughtful examination of the idea of corporate governance. So, after studying this topic, you should then be able to discuss and explain the concept of corporate governance and the crisis of 
corporate governance so that you have a better overview as we move on to the next like, six weeks about what corporate governance is and why uh, it is a very important concept, a very topical uh, concept even today. So what is corporate governance? Um, Justice Owen, who headed the Royal Commission investigating the collapse of the HIH insurance, uh, proposed that corporate governance is the framework of rules, relationships, systems, and processes within by which authority is exercised and controlled in corporations. So he was highlighting authority, the authority that exists within the corporation, who wields the authority on behalf of the corporation, and traditionally, we know that it is the directors or the board of directors that wield the authority in behalf of the corporation. And uh, in the course of this, um, in the course of this podcast, we realize that it both has a common law origin, meaning the courts have long recognized that it is the directors who actually wield the authority in behalf of the corporation, not the shareholders, but the directors who wield the authority in behalf of the corporation. And because the focus of um, corporate governance for a while had been on the exercise of authority, then Bob Tricker would be correct in saying that corporate governance is not you. Because as I pointed out earlier, in that, as he has pointed out in his books and other, uh, other writings that he has, he has uh, done, the idea about authority and authority in companies has been there for, a lot, for you know, several centuries ago even when you know, the, the sovereign charter was given by the king or queen uh, in, the dust, in the Dutch uh, in the East Indies companies and so on. So there was the issue of authority. But later on, we realized that it is insufficient to talk about corporate governance from the viewpoint only of authority because authority, authority without accountability uh, doesn't lead towards ensuring the best interests of the company or the stakeholders of the company. There has to be the question of accountability. And um, for those of you who might be familiar with Spider-Man, uh, the movie at least, uh, I think Peter Parker at one time said, or was it his uncle, Ben Parker, who said, with great power comes great responsibility. So if you're going to be given authority, you have to be held accountable for it. So. Corporate governance, therefore, should be understood from two senses, authority and accountability. And so, why do we need then to talk about corporate governance, knowing that we talk about authority and accountability? Because, as I pointed out earlier, we have a, a problem with most companies because there has been a separation of ownership and management or the control in the running of the company or its operations. Um, you know, when you talk about the early part of the 19th century, it was quite common to see that uh, many of the companies were actually ran by the owners themselves. And this happens too with a lot of family enterprises. The owners of the firm are the ones who are running the firm. But when you examine many of the major companies today. When you talk, for example, of the major companies, the big companies in Australia, whether it's um, Commonwealth Bank, or it could be Telstra or Vodafone, or you talk about you know, the major uh, automotive companies and so on, whether it's Toyota or Honda in Japan, you will realize that the owners of the companies, and when I say the owners, these are obviously the shareholders. The shareholders own shares, which means that they are the, uh, the owners of the company. But the ones who actually own shares in the company do not end up managing the company for the simple reason that you could end up with thousands upon thousands of people holding shares in a company. And it's simply impossible and impracticable for them to be managing the company. And so therefore, there is a problem between you know, uh, the ownership of the company and the management of the company, mainly because particularly now, many of the, especially in relation to public companies, the ones who manage the company are not its owners. And because of this problem, and, what, and I, I use the word management more broadly this time, although we dig deeper into this in a, in a, in a short while, 
I dig deeper into the notion of management in the sense that the directors, although they're not really part of the active day-to-day -day management of the company, they are really part of the management because if you recall you know, your, your lessons in management, management involves planning and organizing and even providing leadership and control or what um, Richard Daft in his book, Management, will talk about POLC, or sometimes planning, organizing, staffing, leading, and controlling. And you will realize that even these management tasks are partly part of the tasks of the directors, because the directors have to provide the, the uh, strategic objectives of the company. They would like to provide the strategic direction for the company. They have to organize in terms of ensuring that you know, they, they appoint uh, the proper persons and do proper investments to make the company grow or to face risk. And they have to provide the leadership as well. And then they have to make sure that uh, there is a control aspect to make sure that the managers uh, do not end up, you know, wasting corporate resources or undertaking major risks. So I, I use that word broadly for now, although we make a distinction in, in a short while that, you know, management, the day-to-day -day management actually belongs to the management team, as opposed to the to the directors who actually supervise and oversee the the day to day operations of the company. So I have I have highlighted at this point the separation of ownership and the management of the company. So because the owners of the company are not necessarily the ones who are managing the company, you have what is known as an agency problem, and oftentimes you can also say it's a problem of the duty duty of loyalty. So that those who are managing the company, which is a delegated authority coming from the board of directors, appointed by the owners or the shareholders, the question arises on whether or not the agents can actually be trusted to protect the interests of the owners or of the directors. So that raises agency problems. And that also brings into the question of whether or not you know, the, the managers themselves will not end up seizing uh, corporate profits that ought to belong to the company. But that raises the idea of agency and uh, duty of loyalty problems. And that is part of corporate governance. It could also involve uh, profit seeking by the agents themselves. So because of the separation of ownership and management and agency and duty of loyalty problems, as well as natural desire for profit seeking by agents, there is a need to uh, get into the discourse about corporate governance. So as I pointed out, uh, corporate governance uh, is not a new concept. It's been there, if you talk about authority, it's been there in the 1600s, even in the 1500s, although it became more popular as a concept in the 1990s with uh, a lot of uh, a string of collapses with World Enron and um, World, Worldcom. So the question is, how do you distinguish corporate governance and management, or are they one and the same? And you probably will notice that in, in the 20th century, management actually was a more popular concept. So you'd have in the MBA programs and in undergraduate programs, what was taught was not corporate governance, but management. It's only in recent years that corporate governance has not emerged as a new unit of study or as a new subject of study. And so there is a huge distinction, mainly because when you, when you speak of corporate governance, your focus is on the, the frameworks, the systems, and processes which involve the exercise of authority within a company. And when you speak of the exercise of authority, real authority inheres in the corporate directors or the direct members of the board of directors. On the other hand, when you speak of management in the management and business literature, we typically, we typically look at management from the viewpoint of the activities uh, that, that are undertaken by the management team, which could be the chief executive officer, the vice presidents, you know, human resource directors, and so on. So that management, as um, traditionally uh, identified by Richard Duff, for example, his book on management, talks about planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. And there is oftentimes very little discussion about the role of the board of directors and where the power or authority within a company actually lies. So these are actually two different things. Authority on one hand, and as we talk about accountability, but when you talk about management, the focus is really on managing, planning, 
uh, planning, organizing, leading, and controlling the company so that the company becomes a profitable venture to make sure that there are profits for the, for the directors and the shareholders of the company and even for the managers and employees. So these are two different concepts and we're going to be talking more about management, particularly uh, towards, I think, uh, week three. Now, so what is important as well is that we make a distinction between old corporate governance, which as pointed out by, by uh, Bob Tricker, is really an old concept because he was talking of authority. But there is a, uh, a newer notion of corporate governance because it emphasizes the need for accountability. So when we talk, therefore, when we look at corporate governance as opposed to management, so when we look at the corporate governance and we look at the idea of authority, the question arises, who exercises and controls corporate authority? Who then is held to account? To whom? Is it directors or is it managers? Because remember, it is the managers who actually undertake the day-to-day -day activities of the firm. And oftentimes, what the managers do, because of what is known as information asymmetry, is not actually known by the directors of the company. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of things that managers can do. Directors won't know unless you know, managers uh, provide reports, complete, honest, and thorough reports to the directors, or unless there is a whistle, whistleblower, for example, who, who then informs the directors that you know, something fishy or dodgy is going on. So who exercises and controls corporate authority? Who is held to account and to whom? So in relation to that question, as we uh, particularly see in a short while, the one, the entity that really exercises corporate authority and controls it would be the board of directors, and we see why. The question of who is held to account, obviously it is the board of directors. So that shouldn't be a, a problem because if you're given authority, you have to be held accountable. But the question is to whom? Does it mean that the directors are held to account by the managers, by the employees, or is it by the shareholders? So is that all what accountability means? Or can the directors be held to account to, by, by broader society, held to account by customers, held to account by employees? And then, so in other words, we, at this point, we should realize that when we talk about corporate governance, corporate governance, isn't just uh, governed by laws coming from the Corporations Act 2001, Commonwealth of Australia, for example. But there are actually other legal regimes that have an effect and an impact on corporate governance or the way that you know, power and authority is exercised within a company. So that there is protection for employees as a result of labor laws within Australia. There are rules to protect the environment because there are rules about environmental protection. There will be rules about occupational health and safety, and they have an implication on corporate governance, in particular in relation to the limits of authority of uh, directors and their ability to be held accountable. We also realize that directors and companies can be held to account by consumers. And this is the reason why we examine later on the law of contracts, uh, as well as the consumer guarantees under the Australian Consumer Law, we also, we, and, and, and you know, when we talk about contracts and the Australian consumer law, the legal obligations that arise, arise mainly because of an agreement that uh, is then entered into between the company or the, the directors and consumers or other individuals. So that is by agreement. But there could also be legal obligations and legal liability, not on the basis of an agreement between parties because we agreed on it, but as a result of tort. And so therefore, when harm is done to an individual and that harm is a result of the breach of certain rights that that individual has uh, as a result of actions undertaken by another, we have what is known as tort, or in the United States, they call it a, a quasi-delict. And even in the absence of a, a, uh, a contract or an agreement between parties, there will be legal liability on the part of a person who breaches the rights of another by his actions. So uh, th this could be because you know um, somebody may end up slipping on um, the floor 
uh, it, like it could be McDonald's, somebody you know buys coffee and um, the floor is wet, somebody gets hurt. It is not because of a contractual undertaking that McDonald's, for example, becomes liable to the employee or to the to the customer. It is because of the idea of tort. Uh, when a business, for example, comes up with a shoddy product that ends up ends up harming an individual. It is not because the individual who gets harmed and the company have actually signed a contract or entered into a contract or sat down to enter into an agreement that the company has to be held accountable. It is because the law, both positive law in the sense that it is a law that is passed by the parliament, as well as the common law recognizes that individuals should avoid doing harm to another. And that is what is known as tortuous conduct. So going back to the question is of um, to whom is accountability owed? It is actually much broader, as I point out, because it is not just about the directors owing uh, certain duties towards the shareholders, but because of a suite of other legal regimes, the directors and the companies and even the employees and the managers uh, are held to account to various stakeholders. And we will later on see that when we talk about accountability, we don't just talk about legal accountability, but also what sometimes would be considered to be moral accountability or ethical accountability, not a legal obligation by itself, but there seems to be a societal obligation. So that, for example, uh, if you're faced with a question, if you were to be the director of a company or you're part of the board of directors and you're engaged in pharmaceuticals and, um, so let's take the case of Purina because one of your uh, one of the one of the uh, students now in our unit happens to be the regional manager in Queensland of um, Purina, and let's assume that uh, Purina has come up, which is a you know very well known uh, dog product, and it's obviously a, a global company, a global product. But let's assume that Purina has come up with. Uh, so this is just a hypothetical case. Let's assume that Purina has come up with a well-known product, and let's assume it's a, it's a medical you know, uh, product that Purina came up with. And it is something that will prevent you know, major diseases. Could be that it will avoid you know, the parvovirus, which is quite common among dogs and which easily kills them. So that if you, but the thing is, given this medical invention or medical discovery by such a, a company such as Purina, Let's assume that if the company were to release it this year, it will mean that that company will probably earn, let's say, $10 million globally. Because at that point, uh, they haven't really protected their pat patents, they haven't really developed a marketing campaign. And so therefore, if they release it in the market because they want to make sure that there are fewer dogs that die, it will mean that it reaps you know, less profits. But if it were to delay its release, the release of the product by, let's say, another five years, and therefore, it has patented its technology and its discoveries really well all over the world. And it has made sure that it has locked up you know, the production processes so that it's not easy for others to, to reverse engineer and imitate their product. And it makes sure that it's a, a fantastic uh, marketing campaign so that you know, the dog owners are aware they're not buying the product. Then, five years from now, instead of earning $10 million today, it can, let's say, earn $500 million. So that's about you know, 100 times. My math is wrong or somewhere, sorry. And that's the reason why I'm a lawyer, uh, not a mathematician. Um, was it $10 million, I said? So, but let's assume that, you know, the, the Purina, by delaying the release of this fantastic medical discovery, can end up avoiding hundreds of thousands of de deaths to dogs by delaying the release of the product. Should the directors then decide not to release the product today? But now, if, however, if you examine that question narrowly and you assume that the, perp, that the duty of directors is mainly to the shareholders so that they end up having more profits when dividends are released, or when you say that you know, directors also owe a duty of, uh, to employees so that because the business is profitable, there'll be a lot of money that could be given as bonuses to employees, and you, know, you, you make sure that the business is really sustainable. If you define it that narrowly, then you would say that the director should release the, the product today. But if you define the issue of accountability more broadly, then you begin to wonder, doesn't the company have an obligation to release the product today 
to make sure that hundreds of thousands of dogs do not have to die. And you can easily, you can easily change the scenario so they talk about a life-saving drug, a life-saving vaccine where if it were released today, would, you know, would mean that the company earns less money, but it would ensure that there, will have to be, there could be hundreds of thousands of lives that are saved. And so, again, there is that broader question of, you know, to whom do you get, become accountable? And that raises the issue of corporate social responsibility, which we will revisit uh, in a short while, as well as um, in week, in topic three. So having said that, let's just look at the, we'll now focus on the role of the board of directors. So typically, uh, the board of directors, and this is coming from the Australian Institute of Company Directors website, the role of the board of directors would be to provide strategic direction to the organization, strategic as, as opposed to operational or even tactical. So strategic means long term. And, you know, looking at the broader and the wider interests of the organization. The marketing director, for example, focuses on marketing, human resources, you know, it also has its own human resources strategy. But here we talk about the board of directors, it's strategic direction for the entire company. It is also the job of the board to monitor the strategic direction of the organization. They also have to monitor the firm's operational and um, financial position. They also, they also have to ensure that appropriate control and uh, monitoring systems are in place to manage the impact of risks because there is always risk inherent in, in businesses, as in life. Uh, they, should, they will also be involved with the appointment and uh, the removal of the CEO, the chief executive officer, where necessary. They will also monitor and oftentimes uh, make decisions in relation to key executive appointments, such as, you know, the chief finance officer, as well as the auditors, and then, you know, plans for executive succession. So these are some of the roles of the board of directors as defined by the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Now, it turns out, uh, in a study made by Mays in 1970, and I'm citing the one in 1979, mainly because this is a journal uh, article, which I've actually uh, also uploaded in, in Moodle, because otherwise it was gonna be a book, and we don't have access to that. But Mays was trying to determine whether or not these roles of the board of directors, as, we, as, as is already well known and recognized, were actually activities that the board of directors were undertaking as far back as the 1970s. And Mays found out that boards did not, in fact, establish strategic objectives and policies at that time. At that time, boards did not provide proper oversight, and oftentimes boards did not choose the key executive team. So at that time, and it's probably happening even today, what they realized that a lot of the boards were just rubber stamp entities. You know, whatever the management team said, they just said, go, it's, it's fine with us. Mainly because uh, in many instances, the members of the board of directors had uh, very lucrative arrangements with the management team. So if they, for as long as they were paid well, they had, you know, good compensation packages, they were happy. And they just let it, let it uh, left it to the management team to, do what it wanted, including setting strategic objectives. So that was, that was one problem. There was a myth. And boards, again, especially in the context where the chief executive officer, who, all, who often also owned shares in the company, if that person was very influential and authoritarian, boards typically would not challenge the chief executive officer. And that happens even today, where you realize that in a lot of the top companies in Australia or the world, you have a chief executive officer who is so powerful, uh, his personality is so strong that members of the board of directors oftentimes will not tangle with the chief executive officer. Especially because the chief executive officer also has his own power because he actually controls the budget. And to a great extent, studies have shown that the chief executive officer can determine who ends up sitting in the board. Because with the money that that person has, the chief executive officer, he can then, you know, send proxy votes to, you know, the shareholders and to influence the outcome of who should be sitting in the board. And especially if the shareholders are happy with the performance of the company, 
whatever the management team says, they're probably likely to just you know, consent or, or approve it. And so the third myth that uh, Mays found out was that boards did not in fact choose the key executive team. It was essentially they're just the you know, chief executive officer who, who owned um, a, a little you know, portion of the shares of the company, but he was controlling the shots. So that's the myth. And again, that brings uh, to fore the problem about corporate governance. So let's examine now a bit more closely, what is the difference between the board as opposed to the executive management team? So we've already talked about uh, the role of the board of directors. What exactly is the role of the executive management team? So the executive management team, which includes the chief executive officer, the chief finance officer, senior directors, uh, managing directors, you talk about the chief executive officer, chief operating officer, vice presidents, and so on. Especially the top executive management team, the CEO, the CFO, and the COO, the executive management team, they usually report directly to the board of directors. And it is the executive management team that takes care of the day-to-day -day operations of the, of the organization. So you now notice that the board of directors is really different uh, co compared to the executive management team in terms of what each of them does. So there's a huge difference there. So that the executive management team reports to the board of directors, the board of directors does not report to the executive management team. How do you distinguish between the board and the shareholders? We know what the board does. The shareholders retain certain powers. They vote at annual general meetings, unless you know, the articles of incorporation uh, have been revised. But typically, the shareholders retain the power to vote at annual general meetings, including uh, electing or choosing the members of the board of directors and possibly to change the articles of incorporation. But shareholders certainly have no say in the strategic directions and day-to-day -day operations of the organization, especially because, as we will later on discuss, we have both in the common law and in positive law or, or based on statutes or laws passed by the common law parliament or even by state parliaments, pertaining to state activities, we realize that um, as far as uh, authority is concerned, is concerned, it is actually the, uh, because of the, what is known as the business judgment rule, whatever decisions are made by the directors and more so by the managers, if it is a legitimate exercise of business judgment, in other words, it is a decision that is informed and done in good faith to promote the interests of the company, then it is not within the purview or it is not legitimate for the courts to second guess or to review such decisions. And so in other words, because of the business judgment rule, decisions that are properly made by the directors and the managers are insulated from review by the courts. And so therefore, it is therefore clear that shareholders cannot direct uh, the company to, you know, say, so that the shareholders will say, oh, uh, you're, we shouldn't be investing in mining because it will ruin the environment. Or we shouldn't be uh, engaging in the production of cigarettes because they're harmful to individuals and so on. Shareholders have no say. Shareholders uh, are limited to voting at annual general meetings. If they are unhappy with the running of the company, then they can just, you know, the way it goes is they, sh they sell their shares. Now, uh, let's talk about the power of the board. So what is the legal basis of the power of the board? So when you speak of the common law, especially in common law countries, what it means is that it is judges making decisions. And the decision made by judges actually uh, are part of the legal system. They are part of the law. And what it therefore means is that unlike in um, civil, civil law countries and civil law jurisdictions such as in the Philippines or even in Spain or even in France, so what, what, what the civil code jurisdictions have is that they typically put their laws in what are known as codes so that uh, the laws are embodied in codes or the law is codified. And what happens then is that um, judges examine what the law is by looking at the code. And judges 
are prohibited from making law by making decisions outside of what is in the statute books or what has been codified by the lawmaking body or the legislation or by, by the uh, legislative branch of, of a particular government. In, law, in common law countries, however, such as countries in Australia, New Zealand, or the UK, what it actually means is that where the law is silent, meaning the law hasn't provided yet, uh, positive law hasn't provided, there is no statute that has really made provisions about a particular circumstance, or uh, the law is silent in a, in a particular area, then it will be the judges then who make the law. And in that case, therefore, the, the judges or the courts um, fill up a vacuum in the legal system by uh, making decisions that then become the law. So having said that, um, in the case, for example, of Winthrop Investments Limited versus Wins Limited, uh, the court said, through Justice Samuels that shareholders may have ultimate control of the company because they can alter the articles or remove the directors, but they cannot interfere in the conduct of the company's business where management is vested in the board. And shareholders have no general power to transact the company's business or to give effective directions about its management. So that's based on the common law. In other words, that's according to um, judge-made law or law made by judges. And that is quite common across all common law countries or jurisdictions. That power or limited power of the shareholders is also recognized uh, in the Corporations Act 2001 Commonwealth, where in section 198A, subsection one, uh, the law provides that the business of a company is to be managed by or under the direction of the directors. So uh, let me just point out that you will notice that although earlier we made a distinction between corporate governance and management, because management was about you know, planning, organizing, leading, and controlling, a broader understanding of corporate governance should actually encompass the idea about managing the directors, because even the Corporations Act recognizes that the business of a company is to be managed by, the, by or under the direction of the directors. So we, uh, although the day-to-day -day management of the company is obviously delegated by the directors to the management team, but because the directors provide the strategic direction and they're meant to provide oversight, then by implication, as I pointed out earlier, the directors do have a role when it comes to planning, organizing, leading, and controlling of a company. So the power of the board is well recognized also by the Corporations Act 2001. So when we speak, therefore, of corporate governance, so far we've talked about corporate governance uh, being the framework of rules, relationships, systems, and processes within and by which authority is exercised and controlled in corporations. And those who exercise and control authority are held to account. So we talked about authority and accountability. The issue about authority, we've discussed that. That is not um, contentious. The issue of accountability, however, is because, as I pointed out earlier, in speaking of corporate governance, to whom are the directors accountable? Are they accountable to the shareholders? The answer is obviously yes, but to the shareholders only? Or are the directors accountable also to employees? Are they also accountable to creditors and suppliers, to customers, to society and the environment? And we realize from the common law and also from the Corporations Act that as far as corporate governance is concerned, the accountability of directors legally and primarily is to the best interests of the company, which is narrowly defined conventionally as being the shareholders of the company. So that they, they, as far as the accountability and legal duty of directors are concerned, they're mainly accountable to the shareholders of the company. They are not accountable to employees. They are not accountable to creditors. They are not accountable to customers. And that is the reason why you have a, a different set of legal regimes that actually protect and promote the interests of employees, creditors, and suppliers, and customers. So you've got occupational health and standard laws, employment laws that protect employees. You've got um, laws pertaining to credit and contracts that protect creditors and customers, and so on. But it leads us to that broader question, 
do directors in acting on behalf of the company owe certain duties to stakeholders, meaning to the non-shareholder stakeholders? Like, the, does the, do the directors owe a duty to the society and the environment? And the example I gave earlier was about Purina developing a, a drug that would avoid deaths of hundreds of thousands of, of dogs. Or it could be a medical intervention or medical instrument or medical product that could save lives of millions of people. But do companies owe a duty to make sure that they just make money? So that what if you have a drug, if you're a pharmaceutical company, and although this is happening today, but let's assume that the cost of the developing the product, the total costs, including, including research and so on, the total cost of a product is, let's say, 50 cents, or maybe even a dollar. And because it saves so many lives, if it, if it, it now enters into a dilemma where if, it, if, it, if the company was just focused on making profits, it may want to sell the, the drug for, let's say, $10. But, I mean, you know, if it were a bit so, socially responsible, it probably will want to sell it for just $10, a multiple of 10 But if it wanted to really make a lot of money, it could probably want to sell it for $1,000 to make you know, a lot of money. And this, is an, this example uh, happened in the US where you had, I think, the, case, the name of Shilesky, who bought a company. It was initially uh, being sold for about $10 a pill. And when he took over the company, he sold it for about 1000 making you know, lots of money. And you notice, uh, if you read the media then, is that eventually you know, the, the US Senate, including uh, Hillary Redham Clinton, intervened because she was being you know, the Senate and everybody else were beginning to wonder, is this unbridled profit-seeking proper even in our society today? And, you know, it's, that's a question that's difficult to answer. We're going to explore it in the succeeding weeks. So do direct companies owe duties to stakeholders? Or is it all about making money for the shareholders? Because after all, shareholders are the ones, you know, have actually invested in the company. They're the ones who have gambled their funds by investing it in the company and uh, shareholders would assume that you know the directors and the company would take care of the investment and if therefore uh, a business ended up promoting the interests of others and not them or engage in philanthropic activity so that you know if a, if a business had 100 million dollars in profits in a year and they gave away 50 million dollars to to charity is that even permissible legally and we examine that question because it is not an easy question to answer. We examine that question in succeeding weeks as well. But I'm just highlighting to you the dilemmas involved in corporate governance. So, and what I talked about was, you know, the, the debate, the tension, which to even today about corporate social responsibility. On the one hand, you have shareholder primacy theory, which asserts that the, the, the main obligation of a company is towards shareholders. So that's known as shareholder primacy theory. And um, Adam Smith uh, would say that, you know, in a capitalist society, what really matters is that uh, those who invest in a company should be given enough incentives and returns for the money that they invest. And that's what, that's what capitalism is all about. The, so that therefore, conventionally, as we understand it today, the main duty of directors and companies would be to ensure and promote the, the interests of shareholders. So that is shareholder privacy theory. It is not the duty of directors to think about stakeholders, not about the environment, not about customers and so on, not about employees even. Now there is a, uh, a little bit of a, uh, an extension of the shareholder privacy theory, uh, and that is the enlightened shareholder value theory, which suggests that actually, when you try to, when a director or a company tries to consider and promote the interests of stakeholders, ultimately, it does redound to the benefit of the company. Because when you, see, when you have a firm that is seen as being socially responsible, then you have customers who want to engage with that uh, company all the more. So that you know, when Starbucks uh, gets into um, fair trading, trading um, buys coffee only from those who are protecting the environment, only buys from suppliers who do not engage in child labor and so on, then uh, customers are willing to pay a premium price for products produced by, by, um, by Starbucks, for example. And when you have a business 
such as Nike at some time, where they engage in child labor, or it could be that you know you have a you have a company which sells diamonds and so on, and it turns out that these diamonds uh, were 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 bought from mining companies in Africa, which engaged uh, in child labor or even slavery, or they ended up beating people who were working in these mines and so on. And this creates a backlash on the part of society so that they don't want to engage with, with, um, with companies that are just too involved in uh, you know, profit-making and just being greedy. So that according to the enlightened shareholder value theory, when a company actually tries to promote as well the interests of stakeholders, ultimately that is very enlightened because it does redound to the benefit of shareholders. The other extreme is known as the stakeholder theory. And that is that um, a, a, a company actually owes broader duties, and it's not just duties to the shareholders, but duties to stakeholders. So that it would be irresponsible for a company to just look at the interests of um, shareholders. So when you talk about global warming and climate change, the broader question arises whether or not companies, even if they're not responsible for emitting gases, uh, greenhouse gases or you know, they really have a low carb, carbon footprint. Do they have a legal and a moral obligation to do more to ensure that, you know, the interests of stakeholders are promoted? And not only those of today's generation, but of future generations. Or to ensure that because uh, climate change will not cause, you know, major disruptions of the climate so that you have uh, low-lying uh, countries, uh, in the, in, in, for example, in the South Pacific, which are in danger of being flooded so that they will no longer be livable. The question really then arises whether or not companies owe a duty to non-shareholders themselves. So that is uh, part of the stakeholder theory. So, and, uh, so we've discussed um, corporate governance and CSR as well. So in this topic, after we have studied this topic, we should then be able to discuss and explain corporate governance and the crisis of corporate governance. We went through, you know, the the old and the new understanding of corporate governance, why it has been important. We talked about the difference between the roles of directors and the roles of managers, and we, we uh, canvassed uh, some of the uh, theories that, that impact on corporate governance, particularly about shareholder theory, enlightened shareholder uh, value theory, as well as stakeholder theory. And with that, uh, I hope you, know, you learned something from this lecture podcast, and I look forward to engaging with you again uh, soon and in the succeeding weeks. Bye.